So far in this series, the most rigged seasons have tended to be the more disliked ones by the fandom, namely season 11, but UK2 is sort of an outlier. It's one of the most rigged seasons in recent memory, with Lawrence Chaney and Ellie Diamond being dragged to the finale, while queens like Tastes and Ahura were consistently cast to the side. While some of these decisions were infuriating to watch, they didn't tank the whole season. And that's because of just how much the rig decisions paid off for producers. Ellie Diamond became the center of controversy during the end of the season, so saving her from the bottom multiple times ended up helping the season in the long run. Rigging has such a negative connotation behind it, but at the end of the day, producers are just trying to make decisions that will help make the best season possible. As we've discussed in other videos, sometimes they miss the mark, but they hit the nail on the head in UK too. The first eight episodes might not have fair judging at all, but they were very enjoyable, and every decision made by producers improved the season. Until this moment, and then everything goes downhill. Grab your trench coats, besties. We're about to solve the mystery behind the riggery of Drag Race UK 2. But before we get into it, make sure you are subscribed to my YouTube channel and have the notifications bell on so that you can see whenever I post a new video. I don't really have a set schedule. I just post whenever, so that will help you. Also, check out my Instagram, check out my Twitter, and if you're able, check out my Patreon. I'm very close to my first goal, which is 25 patrons, and when I hit that, I will do a either a Discord or a Zoom call with all of you, and we can just talk shit on Drag Race. Check that out. Before we dive into our episode-by-episode episode breakdown, I just want to discuss a few overarching themes. One is Lawrence Cheney and Ellie Diamond. The riggery in favor of these two queens is all over the season and can get pretty annoying at times, but I want to look at why the production loved these two queens so much. Lawrence is a natural on camera. I can't even count all the times they randomly cut to her in the confessional, making just random noises, reacting to things. Rue even admits many times throughout the season how much she loves Lawrence. Now, what helps Ellie is that she came in with a story already set up with Lawrence. Lawrence helped Ellie get her drag career started in Scotland, and Ellie now helps Lawrence with wigs and drag, and they have a pretty mutually beneficial relationship. They both help the audience get to know the drag scene in Scotland, an area of the UK that was not represented on the first season of Drag Race UK. So I'm not sure exactly why getting strong representation for Scotland was such a necessity on this season, but it's pretty obvious it was important to producers. As we see towards the end of the season, their season-long story arc together plays a big part in the endgame. So this story thread does have a big payoff. I'm just a little bit confused why it was necessary in the first place. It reminds me a bit of the Rosé and Olivia Lux relationship on season 13, but unlike Ellie and Lawrence, Rosé and Olivia's relationship is brought up in the premiere and set up as like possibly a big storyline, and then almost never mentioned again. <laughs> We never got that big payoff like we did with Lawrence and Ellie on UK2, but that's for another video. This season is also heavily impacted by the pandemic. There was a whole seven months for producers to look at the footage that they got from the first few episodes, probably getting to see them fully edited, and then reassess the direction of the season and who they wanted to see towards the end. I'm sure Veronica Green's disqualification due to her COVID diagnosis put a big halt in the plans for the season, as we saw from those first four episodes, Veronica was a major part of the story and was also getting some rigory in her favor from producers. So I imagine if she had returned post-COVID break, she probably would have been in that top four. Now, something very important to this season is that there are a ton of pre-season relationships that have huge impacts on the season itself. Lawrence and Ellie, Tia and Veronica, Ohora and Tace, Sister and Ginny, Astina and Tace. I would say the preseason relationships are the biggest plot devices of the entire season, and they definitely have an impact on the season as a whole. So let's get into it. Episode one is our little British ball, which they also did on UK One. They had to deliver one look inspired by a UK gay icon and a look that is representative of their hometown. 
And if you couldn't tell from my Midwestern U.S. accent, I am not British. So it was kind of hard for me to know who did well and who did not in this challenge. But have no fear, because my UK crew is here. These absolute angels educated me on all the tea from this episode, as well as gave what they thought were fair placements. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all for the help that you gave me to make this video. The consensus in the UK crew seems to be that Joe Black was sniped out of the competition for basically no reason. As a huge David Bowie fan myself, I was really confused by Michelle's critique that Joe's choice for this Bowie look didn't say Bowie. I mean, that sky blue suit and orange hair is one of his most recognizable looks. So that was a red flag for me. And then the UK crew informed me that for his hometown look, which was criticized for not looking like the building it was supposed to represent, was actually a very smart and spot on representation of it after all. According to my UK crew, obviously I have not been there, but according to them, the inside of this building is the gold color that Joe made his look out of. Now, I'm not sure if he explained this to the judges and if they just like cut it or if he stayed quiet, but I think it's very obvious Joe was eliminated first for story purposes. Many of the other queens hype up Joe Black all episode long as a drag legend in the UK and a huge threat in this competition. I mean, it's a lot. In my opinion, I think they knew they wanted Joe to go home first before the episode even started filming. It explains why the critiques for his looks were so off base. And the editing proves this as they obviously got a lot of the queens to give confessionals about how incredible Joe Black was. I don't know why producers think we like seeing successful people fail, but here we are. What gives them even more incentive to eliminate Joe is the fact that the Rusical was the very next episode, a challenge Joe would almost guarantee to excel at. So losing him here is basically a safeguard that the storyline they want to play out does. And it sends the Queens a message that no one is safe, I guess. I, I don't know. I think it's dumb, but go off, producers. The episode also sets us up with a Tace versus Astina storyline. I guess because they're both dancers, they automatically get pitted against each other. We had the other queens call out this rivalry literally the second they both enter the workroom. It's a bit strange, but okay. The fact that they both decide to do Naomi Campbell for their gay icon look doesn't help them escape this storyline either, making producers amplify it even more. In the end, Astina has the better look and beats out Tace for a win, and we have Tace pissed in the confessional, saying she should have been in the top. It's an interesting storyline, but as we'll soon see, it gets discarded for a more interesting taste plotline. So yes, Sister Sister totally should have lip synced in this episode. Joe Black shouldn't have even been in the bottom three, honestly. Who should have been there in his place? Hmm, you'll have to wait for the follow up to this video to find out. So let's go to episode two, which is Rats the Rusical. And this episode, I think, really starts to reveal who they see as long-term contenders and who they're willing to cast to the side. Right off the bat, the mini challenge sets up the four main plot lines for basically the whole season, where we have Tace winning trade minister of the season, Lawrence winning cockiest queen, Ahura winning secretary of shade, and Tia winning baroness basic. These names will follow these four queens for the entirety of their time left on the season. Tia, having a basic wardrobe, is something many other queens call her out for all season long, and as we see later in this episode, causes her to get negative critiques on the runway, despite having a good performance in the challenge itself. Ahura proved she had a sharp tongue in Untucked the first week, calling out Estina's wardrobe and generally having a nasty attitude, and as we see in her storyline this episode, she doesn't like being anything other than gorgeous and judges other queens who deviate from this way of thinking. Tace is called the trade, and we start to get early hints of her storyline with Ahura being former lovers, Ooh, as Ahura tells us in the confessional that she has been with Tace in the past. Now, Lawrence being cocky is also a major storyline in this episode, as her failure in the rehearsals for the musical caused her to have a breakdown moment and cry, and she's then called out by her scene partners for dragging them down with her. 
Lawrence does not come off in a positive light in this episode, but it leaves her lots of room for development in later episodes. So as you can see, these four storylines eat up most of the episode screen time and all have a bigger part in the narrative arc of the season. That is why it is so brilliant to set up this kind of mini challenge early on in the season. In the critiques for the challenge, we have Ellie and Lawrence both being saved hardcore for the first time. Neither were great in this challenge, but Ellie is in the top for some literally random reason. I still am shook by this. I literally thought she was in the bottom when I saw her on that stage. And then when she got positive critiques, I was like, where? Literally where? We all know Tace is basically ruined Michelle's punching bag all season. And here is where we get the start of that storyline. If Tace was in the bottom, Ellie should have been right there next to her. Let's move on to Veronica, who also gets a lot of screen time this episode, and it sets up a major underdog edit for her. But it's kind of a weird underdog edit. We have Veronica telling us she's amazing, and we have the other queens telling us she's amazing, yet Veronica is acting like no one thinks she deserves to be there. I don't know, it's odd, but she wins the challenge, and it, I guess, lets us know she's a competitor even though she and the other queens have been telling us all episode that she is. Note how there's one queen I have yet to mention once in this entire video, Cherry Valentine. <laughs> she has no storylines with other queens, no ties to any of her competitors. So losing her in this episode is basically a safe bet by producers to not cut any potential story arcs short. Let's move on to episode three. And this is where Ahura and Tasa's storyline really takes form. It also highlights a lot of the main relationships of the series. Rue tells the girls to pair up with their bestie and then lets them know they're competing against each other in a who wore it best design challenge. We have Veronica, sad that she put her bestie Tia Coffee in a bad spot by making the better garment, but I don't know who she's kidding because hers was not much better. Like at all. Ahura and Tace are paired up and they get into their closeness off the show with Ahura even taking time out from her own garment to help Tace with hers. But the biggest storyline is Ginny Lemon unpacking her insecurities with being sexual and showing off her sexuality. The judges had not yet to appreciate Ginny's take on drag, which I would say is grand matronly. I think the only reason we don't see Ginny lip sync and probably go home this episode is because of this story. Her garment might have been the worst on that stage. It's only a piece of fabric wrapped around her body, but she fulfilled what Rue asked of her while revealing a lot about her upbringing and gender identity. Ginny was an absolute delight in this episode, and I do think seeing her go home would have been gut-wrenching in this moment. So. While I 100% think she should have been in the bottom, I fully understand why the producers saved her over Astina. Speaking of Astina, now that Tace was tied up in a new, much more interesting story arc with Ahura, that doesn't leave much for her Astina to do. And a lot of people were shocked by Astina's early exit because of her challenge win in episode one, but I wasn't too shocked. Astina talked a big game but she wasn't a huge personality, and especially against Tia Coffee in the bottom two, who was basically the narrator of the season and had a huge personality, I can see why Estina was cast aside on the priority lists for producers. Also, can we just say how quick the producers and Rue were to give Lawrence a win, literally the second that they got the opportunity? Rue basically hurls the win at her face in this episode. It's funny. Episode four. We have the Morning Glory challenge, and here we have the producers saving Veronica Green. She 100% should have lip synced in this episode. And what's a bit weird is they show the queens a lot this season actually calling out the riggery. Basically, all the queens in Untucked tell Veronica she should have been in the bottom. And so this kind of only amplifies her underdog storyline moving forward. Instead, they put Sister and Ginny in the bottom, Sister and Ginny had already shown they were pretty good friends and a support system for each other in the competition. So putting them against each other is great for storyline purposes, 
but they also didn't have much storyline left on their own. Sister is basically a non-entity on the entire season until she steals Ahura's look later on. And Ginny's storyline played out in the previous episode, so there was nowhere else for her to go. Losing either one of these queens makes sense, whereas Veronica was the underdog and was pretty confrontational, to be honest, with the other queens. Losing Veronica this early would be a detriment to the season. Well, sorry producers, COVID is coming for your story arcs. Lawrence gets the win here, and why? In my opinion, and from what I'm getting from the poll that I put out, Ahura 100% was the standout in this episode. She fulfilled a major plot arc that she's had the entire season up to this point, which is about wanting to be beautiful and put together at all times. Her conflict with Tia is resolved in this episode, and this really could have been the episode everything comes together for her and she gets her first win. But nope, Lawrence basically just needs to cough and Rue finds her hilarious. So don't get me wrong, Lawrence did good in the challenge, but just not as good as I feel like she could have done, whereas Ahura blew all expectations out of the water for how people thought she would do in an improv challenge. For some queens, and this happens in other seasons too, not just UK, a growth edit is more important to producers than being a contender for the crown. And that fits Ahura's narrative to a T. There were multiple challenges. She could have been in the top or even gotten a win, but she was not prioritized as much as other queens. That's because her story was more about her growth as a queen and as a person rather than her being a threat in the competition. We now are back after seven months due to COVID and we have the iconic Ruru Vision Challenge that gave us UK Hun and the United Kingdoms. Now, Obviously, the winning team deserved to win. In the bottom team was Ellie Diamond, Tia Coffey, Joe Black, and Sister Sister. So we can take a look at each of their critiques to hone in on where their storylines are at this point in the competition. Ellie Diamond is called out for her ugly look in the challenge and sloppy dance moves, but like, barely? They kind of gloss over this and instead just throw praise her way because of her runway look and her makeup skills. Rue even says Ellie was her favorite in the challenge, and I'm just like, where? We've seen glimpses of it before, but we're now in total Ellie rickery mode, and I'm not sure why. <laughs> in the first four episodes, Ellie never really stood out or delivered tons of personality or drama, so I'm at a loss here. Maybe they thought she was going to be the young fashion queen favorite, but with Bimini's updated runway looks, she takes that role over. I don't really know why they decided from here on out to drag Ellie to the finale, but I definitely think Ellie was the second worst in this challenge and should have lip-synced here with Joe. Tia is ripped to shreds for her runway look, and they spend a ton of time on this. I think maybe because the girls all had seven months to update their looks, and Tia came out in this... But they also say Tia did really well in the challenge, so this is one of those weird instances where the judges decide runways count in placements and throw Tia in the bottom because of it. Tia's story so far is that she has all the talent and looks to be unstoppable, but hinders herself with her subpar runways. I mean, she is the Baroness of Basic, so... Maybe the producers felt this would be a good angle to take for her story, since she did not improve her looks like many of the other girls did. Sister Sister actually, in my opinion, did the best of their group in the challenge, and she does get praise for it, but she's given the low placement for stealing Ahura's look and not doing it nearly as well. Again, they randomly use the runway as a justification for the placement, obviously just to have a reason to keep Ellie out of the bottom three, Pay attention, guys. They literally only bring runway into criteria for dishing out placements when it's to save another queen. I'm serious. I'll talk about it more in other videos. Then there's poor Joe Black. There's not much to say here. She wore a terrible look in the challenge that she literally called out as being terrible. So, like, why not just wear something else? I don't know. Joe was clearly the worst in the challenge, and as the comeback queen, she had to have really slayed to not meet the revolving door right back home. Now we have the Snatch Game, and I'm actually pretty surprised they put Lawrence in the bottom here. It was fully deserved, but 
they've been so obsessed with giving her the best possible track record that I really thought they were going to save her here, but no, she lip syncs and sends Tia Coffee home. Tia's story was done for now, so it makes sense for her to go home here narratively. And also, she did not do well this episode. I think that they threw Lawrence in the bottom because they knew Tia Coffee was going to go home. And a lot of times, it's good to see a front runner in the bottom because it shows vulnerability. So maybe that's what they were going for here. The real gag of this episode is that Ahura is put in the bottom three when she had, in my opinion, the second best performance. And based on the poll I released, you guys overwhelmingly agree. It really made absolutely no sense to me. She had the accent, the look, the props, the gags, but they had to do it to save Ellie from a low placement who, in my opinion, was who deserved it the most. She barely had any jokes and had one of the worst runway looks of the night to top it off, but the judges weren't going to let Ellie touch that bottom, period. So, sorry, Ahura. Next episode is the Super Shiro Design Challenge, and Ahura finally gets a solo win. This caps off her storyline pretty perfectly, too, as she was very disappointed in herself for losing this challenge earlier in the season, which she mentioned was because she helped taste so much. And here we have Ahura putting all of her focus on herself and getting the win, while Taste is left to make her outfit alone and ends up in the bottom two. Sister Sister goes home here, and beside her tiffs with Ahura and Veronica, she really didn't have a big storyline, so this was kind of a no-brainer at this point. And now we have the dreaded stand-up challenge. First, I just want to say that Ellie was given the mini-challenge win strictly for storyline. She's the only queen left that doesn't have a challenge win, so giving her the power here to make the order of the stand-up show definitely would spice things up. Obviously, she sabotages people and tons of drama erupts, which is probably just what the producers were hoping would happen. But we probably have the biggest example of Ellie's favoritism by producers when she's saved from the bottom here. Ellie was hands down the worst set of the night. It was awkward and cringy, and you all voted so in the poll, so I don't feel bad for saying that. Taste 100% should not have been in the bottom here. Besides getting read to filth by Michelle, who's like, wow, Taste, I thought you were going to be horrible. It just really showed that they did not have their eyes on Taste at all. And she was never going to be the winner of the season with a critique like that. So now, not only do we have a Taste and a horror lip sync, which I'm sure the producers were salivating for all season, but it's not the double Shantae of the season, despite both giving incredibly moving and powerful performances. I put up a poll for this lip sync on my Instagram, and it was pretty close. I think Taste had like 56 or 57%, and Ahura had like 43, 44, but that's pretty even for a lip sync. This 1000% should have been the double Shantae. And instead, spoiler alert, they wasted on Ellie. Ahura was fresh off of a win, and was literally total top four material. But like I said, her story was about growth, not about getting the crown. And with her win the previous week, her storyline was kind of over. Think Ms. Cracker in season 10. It's the same kind of story. And both are sacrificed at top five right before they would hit top four and be a potential threat for the crown. Hmm, interesting. Final four is an acting challenge, and they finally throw Ellie in the bottom two, just to save her for literally some reason. Tace also gets another, wow, we thought you were going to suck in this challenge, but you didn't. But we're still going to throw you in the bottom anyways. <laughs> and I guess that's all that really happens in this episode. And that brings us to the finale. But before we talk about that win... I want to talk about Bimini Bon Boulash because we haven't talked about her basically this entire video. And that's because there was no rigging for or against her in basically the entire season. She dominated almost every challenge and was rewarded as so. I think that's what makes this Lawrence win feel so subpar and what got people so angry. Lawrence dominated in the first half of the season but struggled a lot in the second half, not being able to deliver to the caliber she set for herself pre-COVID. 
Meanwhile, Bimini was the opposite, starting off in the bottom and slowly climbing in placements until she absolutely demolished the last five challenges of the season. Viewers are always going to remember more recent episodes. So Bimini slaying the competition is going to be much more relevant in their minds than Lauren slaying the competition way earlier on. And plus, isn't it better to start weak and end strong rather than the other way around? In the final performance to A Little Bit of Love, which is one of the best Rue songs ever, by the way, Lawrence has the worst performance, which isn't shocking because she has struggled a lot in performance-based challenges before. She's not a dancer or a singer, and she did good with everything considering, but Bimini, Tace, and Ellie all have this as their strengths, right? Watching that final performance and knowing Lawrence gets the win in the end just doesn't sit right. It's one thing if Lawrence didn't have the best track record of the final four, but did the best in the final challenge, but she didn't have the best track record and she was the worst in the final challenge. I don't want this to sound like me crapping on Lawrence. She's obviously a hugely talented queen, but I think she got in her own way towards the end of the season. As to why I think Lawrence got the win, maybe it's for representation's sake, as there has yet to be a plus size winner on a main US or UK drag race season. Maybe because she was Rue and the producer's favorite and she had a great storyline. Maybe because they want Bimini to come back and slay an All-Stars. There's lots of options, but I do think that Lawrence is a great winner overall, which I know I was just <laughs> crapping on her the whole time. Was she the best winner? No, but I still think Lawrence makes for a great winner. Was Bimini more deserving? Probably, but I don't want my love for Bimini to take away from how great Lawrence is too. Overall, UK2 was rife with Riggery, especially towards Ellie Diamond and Lawrence Cheney. It might have led to what lots of fans considered a very unsatisfying conclusion, but there's no arguing that the queens of UK2 are all superstars. They brought us fashion, drama, storylines, gags, and tons of laughs. And that's all we can expect from a silly TV show about people in wigs and breastplates, which they showed us basically every five minutes. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. This was so fun to watch. I had a lot of fun with this season. And I'm excited to see what Lawrence does now that she is getting her own TV show for Wild Presents Plus. Also, I just want to point out that both Tace and Bimini are getting tons and tons of brand deals. Tace is the new face of Coca-Cola. Bimini is on all kinds of magazines. So even though they didn't win, they're still doing great for themselves. Literally everyone in the season, I think, did an incredible job. And I'm excited to see what they do with their careers as we move forward forward. Now, I'm going to start to go back and redo a couple of my old videos uh, from way before I would ever talk on camera. <laughs> so that'll be coming next. And then we will be getting the follow up to this video, which is what would have happened if there was no riggery on UK2. And I'm using your poll results as well as my opinions, which always line up to figure that out. So Thank you guys so much for watching. It has been a great day of solving the mystery of where Joe Black got that hideous dress at so that I can buy them all and then burn them. I will see you guys soon.